Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 24th of February. And this quicker look, this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 27th of February, with me, Michael Hewson. Um, it's also a significant date today. It's one year on from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it seems remarkable to me that European markets have recovered all of the losses of uh, last year, and are actually now slightly higher than they were this time last year, while US markets are broadly lower, although not by much, despite the significant weakness we've seen in the tech sector. And it's even more remarkable, I think, given how much higher interest rates are now than they were a year ago. If you think about um, February this time last year, the Federal Reserve was actually still easing monetary policy, and now it's um, it's the, the, the Fed funds rate is now at four and a half to 4.75 percent. Bank of England is at four percent. The ECB, you know, is back above three percent and likely to go by another 50 basis points in March. Nonetheless, there has been a cost. There's been an economic cost in terms of this, these higher levels of interest rates, high inflation. There has been um, cost of the cost of living we've seen that soar it's also important to note the billions of dollars euros and sterling that have been spent to support respective economies which have gone a long way to cushion the blow but certainly haven't cushioned it completely along with the fact that we've also been helped by the fact that demand in china has been constrained by covid restrictions which have taken some of the pressure off energy demand in fact if you look at commodity prices particularly uh, wheat and corn, we can see that after the spike of 2022, we settled back a much more realistic levels, back to the levels that we were back in 2007, but also back at the levels that we were in September, the summer of 2012, when there were those fires in the breadbasket of Europe, of Russia and Ukraine, which decimated the um, wheat and corn crops from that particular year. The difference this time, however, is that while the capacity from Ukraine and Russia came back online in subsequent years and subsequent harvests, I don't think that's going to help us this time. And for that reason alone, I think it's going to be quite likely that inflationary pressures are likely to remain elevated. Earlier this week, we had Citigroup um, talk about the, pos the prospect that UK inflation could fall back to 2% by the autumn. Now, I really struggle with that idea. I really do. When you look at the price pressures that are currently starting to seep in to core prices this week, EU CPI, um, core CPI was revised to a new record high of 5.3%, even though the headline numbers have fallen quite sharply in the past two or three months. Today, we've got US core PCE. And certainly, I think in the context of recent ISM numbers, services numbers, inflation numbers, retail sales of 3% in January, I think it's highly unlikely that the declines in headline inflation, while they'll still happen, I think we'll start to see, I think core prices are going to be much more difficult to bring lower. And I think that's something that markets still haven't really come to terms with when it comes to what is likely to come next. We've priced out the prospect of rate cuts this year, um, given the recent narratives from the likes of Bullard and Mesta that we saw last week. Bullard this week clarified his position on the neutral rate for um, his projections, which is around about 5.37% or 5 and 3 eighths, which is broadly in line with the 5.4% that Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed suggested would be the right, the right rate for a pause. So you're talking 5.25 to 5.5% Fed funds rate, which is another two 25 basis point rate hikes. The bigger question is, when are rates likely to come down? And an awful lot of that will depend on obviously core inflation. And at the moment, that runs that is running the risk of not only um, remaining sticky, but potentially edging a little bit higher. Certainly, that has been the trend if we look away from the headline inflation numbers. 
So what's that meant for stock markets this week? Well, stock markets this week, I think, have struggled a little bit. We've come under pressure. Um, we're still, we've still been fairly resilient overall. And certainly, I think European markets have, have continued to maintain the resilience that we've had over the course of the past few days. But we have seen significant weakness this week. But given how far we've come since the start of the year, we were always going to get some form of a pullback. And at the moment, with respect to the FTSE 100, if we look at this series of highs back in January, 78.75, we pretty much bounced off that earlier this week. So that for me, 78.75 is going to be a key support level, anywhere between 78.75 and 7,900. If we start to break through that, then we could well slip back towards the 50-day moving average. But overall, the trend higher for European markets remained intact, remains intact. So I'm not ready to throw in the towel on a peak on European markets. The trend doesn't support that. So for all the headlines that we've been saying about, oh, well, you know, European markets are likely to start to roll over, I'm not seeing any evidence of that. And if we look at the way that the DAX has rebounded this week, it's continued to find support in and around 15,240 there or thereabouts. We look at the 10th of Feb lows, we look at the uh, 13th of Feb, we look at the lows this week, fairly solid support at those sorts of levels. Also, 50-day moving average and the trend line from the lows there. So for me, the, 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 what we're seeing at the moment still remains very much by the dip territory. US markets again, but we are once again testing a fairly key support line on the S&P 500 and as well as the 50-day moving average. There, I would, I would argue potentially that the US market rally is probably more at risk than the European one. That's not to say that we can't continue to move higher, but at the moment with the likelihood of higher rates for longer, it remains, I think, probably at a greater risk of rolling over than perhaps the um, rally that we're seeing in European markets. But it's certainly a level to keep an eye out for. The 50-day moving average, the 200-day moving average on the S&P 500. Similarly with the NASDAQ. Again, we're finding some fairly decent support in and around that 12,000 area, which also coincides with these series of peaks through here. So I think it's important to keep an eye on that, as well as the 50-day, the 200-day moving average and the 50-day moving average, which is converging there. We are looking a little bit oversold, but that's not to say that we can't ratchet lower if we get a break of those key supports. So I think that in a nutshell, I think sums up where we are in terms of uh, stock markets. The dollar is starting to make a bit of a comeback. And I think while the dollar remains strong, it's going to be very difficult for US markets to rally. I think we, we, we're still on course on euro dollar for a move to 104.80, which is these lows here. We're slowly rolling over on the 50-day moving average, which is now starting to act as a little bit of a cap on euro strength. We're still going to get that 50 basis point rate move from the ECB in March. It's really a question of what comes after that, particularly when you see that the German economy contracted by 0.4% um, in the fourth quarter, which was a downgrade from the previous uh, minus 0.2%. So the German economy is still struggling. Energy prices have come down. Um, but the bigger question I think that needs to be asked with respect to energy prices is can they come much lower, given the fact that um, the capacity, you know, while, while the Ukraine war is rumbling on, Russia is going to be shut out of global energy markets. And the only business that they're going to be able to do is with countries like China and India uh, and, and obviously other, other states of um, that nature. So you could be looking at Iran as well, because they're not going to be able to do business in the normal way which essentially will mean that China will be able to strike a very hard bargain when it comes to Russian oil and gas. They'll be able to drive the price down. Um, so, you know, that, that basically means that, that going forward, it's going to be very, very difficult for energy prices to move much below the levels that we've seen already this week. I'll come to, actually, I'll come to them now, seeing as I'm talking about them, it makes sense. We are still in the downtrend that we've been in for Brent crude over the course of the past few weeks. But it's interesting to note here that what we've got is 
a nice little uptrend going through here. So at some point, something has to give on this. Now, there has been some talk that oil prices could go above $90 to $100 a barrel. At the moment, the price action does not support that. But if we do break above these peaks back in February, which is around about the $87 a barrel level, $87, $88 a barrel, we could well see a ratchet up to $90.95. But it's also interesting to note that despite all the bullishness on oil prices, some of the more extreme examples of $100, $110 a barrel have started to come in from the big US banks. So certainly worth keeping an eye on when it comes to crude oil prices going forward. Um, with respect to the dollar again, moving moving back to this, we're still stuck in this range on the cable between the 50 and 200 day moving average. I expect that to continue with a slight downward bias towards 118.35 in the same way that I would expect the euro dollar to track lower towards its previous lows at 104.80. 118.35 is I think the key support level on cable um, with the 50 day moving average on the upside, capping any declines around, capping any advances around about 122, 120, 180, as laid out in my daily note, which can be found on the news and analysis section of the CMC markets website. Euro sterling still very much stuck in a range. We can see that there. Um, finding a little bit of resistance around the 50 day moving average here, um, but we could probably draw a line through this series of peaks through here to get a good indication of where we are on euro sterling. So certainly worth keeping an eye on that trend line resistance there. As we look ahead to next week, we've got EU flash CPI for February. Um, that's going to be particularly interesting in terms of whether or not core prices go any higher. They're already at a record high of 5.3%. Um, the bigger question, I think, with respect to February um, flash CPI as we look ahead to next week is whether or not it's going to come down any further. Now, predictions are for that to come down from 8.6 to 8.1. But again, core prices are expected to remain static at around about 5.3 percent and potentially could even head towards head higher to a new record of 5.4. So you see flash CPI on the 2nd of March on the Tuesday. We've got also ISM services data on February the 3rd of March. No non-farm payrolls on the 3rd of March. That's been, supposed, that's been postponed or pushed out to the 10th, um, largely on the basis of the fact that February being a short month, it hasn't given them enough time to collate the data. That's the 10th of March. Unfortunately, there won't be a webinar, non-farm payrolls webinar that particular day um, because I will be doing a, a client event in Dublin. So unfortunately, I won't be available to do the webinar. Um, nonetheless, I'll probably do a little bit of a little bit of a preview uh, next Friday, albeit it'll be um, slightly dated by the time the payrolls numbers come around. So we've got fairly light data week services ISM. That was a really decent number um, in the January numbers. And obviously that prompted the real hawkish spike that we saw, um, particularly in US two year two and, and 10 year Treasury yields, and, and which has seen us basically rise up to around about 4.7%, as can be seen from this graph here. So we're back at the levels that we were back in November for the two year, around about 4.7%. And I think the bigger question that people will be asking is whether or not the January spike um, in the ISM services will translate into a similar resilience in February. And that, I think, will be a key arbiter of whether or not we start to see a little bit of softening in the recent rise that we've seen in the US dollar. So keep an eye on those two-year yields, 4.7%. If we start to head higher than that, then that is obviously going to exert further upward pressure on the US dollar. In terms of earnings announcements coming up, um, we have got Associated British Foods, Primark. Um, they've seen some fairly decent gains so far this year, and they are long overdue because certainly I think looking at the numbers last year, this is their Q2 numbers, um, we've seen an over 50% rally 
since those 10 year lows back in October. Um, and that suggests that potentially we could well see further gains back to the levels that we saw back in the highs of last year, um, January 2022. There's no reason to suppose that we cannot. Um, if we look at all of their businesses for the new year, Primark said they expect their adjusted operating margin to fall to lower than 8% on the back of higher costs. Um, they're also keeping their prices unchanged for both the winter and summer ranges. But total group revenue in January increased 20% to £6.7 billion, pounds, um, with the retail business reporting a 15% increase in revenues to 3.14 billion pounds. It's, Primark is get, getting even greater UK market share, 7% of the clo total clothing market, and European trading has also been strong with new stores in Romania and Italy, um, said to be trading strongly. So if um, performance across all the retail markets continues to trade <coughs> in line with the decent performance that we saw in Q1, then we could see further news um, play out in. So um, moving on from Associated British Foods, we've also got the latest numbers from Ocado, but I'm not going to focus on them. I'm going to look at ITV because we've seen some fairly uh, decent performance, decent recovery from ITV's share price over the course of the past few months. Some of that has been around speculation that ITV Studios could be the target of a takeover bid. Um, uh, in November, ITV reported total revenue here to date of a 6% rise to £2.95 billion, but it's the advertising business where they have actually been struggling. Somewhat of an Achilles heel. Q3 numbers were expected to be disappointing and were not really a surprise. Um, we saw total advertising revenues down in July, August, September and October. The big question is, is how, how well did they do in December with the, with the, with the World Cup? Um, did that provide a significant boost? Um, ITV Studios has continued to do well, 6% increase in revenues in Q3. Obviously, this is part of the business that is really um, contributing quite significantly and is now set to make up over 50% of ITV's overall revenues. ITVX has obviously also been launched and um, was launched on the 8th of December. And in January, ITV announced that its revamped service would, had delivered a 55% increase in viewing in December, as well as a 65% increase in online users. So the big question around that, speculation will continue to rise with respect to a sell-off of its ITV studios, I do not expect that to amount to anything because why would you sell your best performing asset? It just, it's just a completely ridiculous notion. But then again, stranger things have happened. So that's ITV. We've also got Target, big US retailer. Um, we saw Walmart come out with its numbers um, earlier in the week and they were middling and slightly better than expected, but it was the outlook that I think was people were a little bit spooked by with respect to Walmart. That has taken the edge off target shares, which appear to have found a little bit of a, an offer at around about $180, $180, $182. Be interesting to see whether or not they can, they'll probably continue to trade in the range that they've been trading in over the course of the last six to nine months. And I don't expect to see any significant change there. As I say, they warned back in pro they warned on profits back in May and they've struggled to recap or recoup those losses thus far. Um, also got Rivian, um, been a bit of a car crash, all told, sorry, pun completely intended. Um, when they reported back in Q3, there was optimism that the share price had stabilized, but it's rolled over since then. Um, Certainly in terms of their output, full year losses are expected to still be in the region of $5.4 billion. Still has plenty of cash, but rising costs are becoming a problem unless they look at raising prices in the months ahead. Since those November numbers are released, the share price has fallen sharply, not for any other reason that US interest rates have continued to rise, which means that the case for investing in a loss-making business 
is becoming a lot less compelling. And ultimately, unless they can start to ramp up their 25,000 annual target growth, um, annual target for deliveries and production quite significantly, then they will continue to hemorrhage cash, even though their order book is fairly healthy. It's got 114,000 pre-orders at last count. So that's it for uh, this week, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you very much for listening. I'll talk to you same time, same place uh, next week. Have a great weekend and I'll speak to you next week. Thank you very much for listening.